Good afternoon, everyone. This is Vanessa with Location Tech. Welcome to our webinar. Our topic today is future proofing your solution to the Anaheim Hotel Panic Button Ordinance Requirements. And we're going to show you how best in class options deliver lower cost of ownership and flexible capabilities. And I'm very excited to have two Location Tech uh, leadership team members with us here today. I'll introduce them so they can say hello. First is Rajesh Kumar, our Chief Product Officer. You want to say hello, Rajesh? Uh, hi, hi. Glad to see everybody on the call and hope to share some information as we go along. Awesome. And Jeff Engel, CEO. Uh, good afternoon to some of you. Good morning. So appreciate the opportunity and uh, I think it's going to be great. Yeah. Well, let's get into it. Um, we're going to start with a brief introduction to location tech and our guiding principles. And I think, uh, Jeff, you're you're up for this one to begin. Yeah, uh, it, this is actually location tech has been something that's been a nagging problem for me that we're solving now. That's been a nagging problem for me for 20 plus years. And it, and it started when I was in the Navy SEALs and it was around when we would be given um, a direct action mission, which means we're going in, we're doing a hostage rescue mission, or even doing something very hospitality related when we are working with foreign nationals of how to help them. It was always around location and when things move or knowing where things are, and where things are moving uh, and knowing what's, what's being signaled is extremely valuable to to a responder and so when i look at this as a responder perspective this has been something that's been the dreaming for me the missing link for many many years was being side by side with some of the back with really good technologists people that i would say are as good most likely better than me which was very similar to how it was when i was in the navy seals is being surrounded by peers that were just absolutely best of breed and able to do things and so it was 20 years in the making to solve a problem that we in, this, in the SEALs had and to where we are today. And really its formation is from problems I saw way back when, and then identifying people that are, that are I'm grateful to be surrounded with to help solve the problem. Excellent. Rajesh, yeah. do you have a few words? Thanks, uh, thanks Jeff. Yeah, that, that was uh, an important piece, um, knowing the need for these kinds of solutions uh, in the marketplace, I guess. So I come from a wireless technology background uh, and myself and a few others worked in the wireless industry for uh, well over a quarter century. I worked in many different aspects of wireless, so multiple uh, generations of cellular, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and so on. And so, and we've done a lot of work on protocols and state machines and so on, and so we have we bring a lot of experience from that perspective, but when it was combined with this particular need, uh, that made it all the you know very meaningful for us. So when we started developing the location tech solution, we <clears throat> put in a few guiding principles, and and I just briefly touch on those here, and we'll build on them as we go along on in individual slides. And the first part is to have minimal infrastructure because you can solve a lot of problems by throwing a lot of hardware at it. But when you look at the hospitality industry, cost is a big constraint. And so throwing a lot of hardware is gonna add up the cost. More importantly, it's gonna make the deployments that much more complicated. So reducing, keeping the infrastructure to the minimal level was an important guiding principle. The second part, and maybe this should be the first one, but how accurate, Jeff alluded to the importance of location, but how accurate are those location fixes? So from our engineering background, so of an R&D background, this was really important. Like we needed to get it right. But at the same time, it couldn't be a very heavy duty solution, right? Again, going along with that first thing I mentioned about minimal infrastructure. So that was the second thing, that our location prediction, location fixes had to be very accurate. The third one was, as engineers, we hate painting ourselves into a corner. So we want the system to be expandable. Right? It, it shouldn't be something that you do it and if you want to make a change, you have to fix, you have to rip it out and change everything. So, so that was another guiding principle that it had to be able to support additional functionality without 
doing a lot of changes. The fourth one was not to fall into the trap of not invented here syndrome. In other words, if there is a solution out there for a problem, let's just use it. Right? We, we are better off if we can solve new problems for things that don't exist. That's where we can add value. Just reinventing the wheel is of no interest to us. So that was another thing that if we could reuse something, and that's why we chose the uh, sort of the Laura thing that we talked about, I'm going to talk about shortly, because there is a big ecosystem of devices out there, and we don't need to create those. We don't need to reinvent those things. So that was another thing. Don't reinvent the wheel. Um, and then finally, uh, and perhaps most crucially for the end user, keep it simple and intuitive to use. The deployments should be simple and it should be really easy to use, right? We can make it very complicated. We can add all kinds of bells and whistles, but in our experience, those are systems that actually don't get used. They might be really nice and they might be great. You might feel great buying it, but if you don't use it, it doesn't serve the purpose. So these are the five sort of guiding principles that um, we had in mind uh, going into kind of the location techs uh, journey. And we'll build on these as we go along uh, this, the rest of this webinar. Back to you, Vanessa. Thank you. So before we move into looking under the hood at our solutions, uh, we thought it'd be smart to take a quick moment to review why we're talking about this from, uh, from the first place. Yeah, so, so when we started, uh, the, these mandates are being pushed and these mandates being panic buttons requirements and there's some square footage requirements and et cetera. And we're seeing this go across uh, across the U.S. and it's predominantly happening in Southern California right now. Uh, started in Los Angeles last year. Anaheim's going on right now, which is the focus that we had a webinar a couple weeks ago talking about the legalities of what needs to be done what's going to happen panic buttons required now there's a vote coming up uh in october and then the requirements to have an install and the immediate requirements are uh all workers uh that are assigned to a guest room or or an area where they can be by themselves need to have a some form of emergency contact device that needs to track location uh and it needs to track exact location so when someone pushes a button Someone needs to know not only what floor they're on, but what room they're on, they're, that they're in. It needs to be accurate. There we go. So one of the things, that, and there, there's lots of solutions out here, and this is where um, you can it can be overwhelming with there's so many choices, but there are differences out there. And there are some solutions that are very good in their own right, but are, ne are not necessarily right for hospitality. One of the use cases that is a three two dimensional bird's eye view of a thing. And so if you're in a flat building or more or more likely outside, that works great. You know where you are, your pinpoint, it's like Google Maps when you're driving down the road, you know where you are. The next generation, which I think it's a little scary is is a 3d location so right floor um in right room but having blind spots because it doesn't have clean coverage which goes back to what we just uh talked about earlier our guiding principles is making sure that we have a blind spot free because these can give a false impression the ones where it's 3d with blind spots can give the impression that it works but if someone goes into a stairwell or someone goes into an area that's not covered, then all of a sudden you've lost visibility to where they are. And so the again, the guy in principle of us is really can we can we give? And this was just going back to my original use case, original problem I was trying to solve way back when is identifying precise location in a building three-dimensionally. So we're not looking for submetering where we know exactly where a pin is on the floor, but can we make sure we get the right room? So as, as a responder that they show up to the right room uh, on the right floor. Yeah, just to build on that, um, you know, the, the bullet at the, the center to the end of the slide, it says, you know, the wireless panic button system is only effective as, as effective as accuracy. And that's an important point to register because as Jeff mentioned, we've studied on all, a lot of the solutions that are already in the marketplace. And <clears throat> most of them use very similar approaches for indoor location. This is a problem in the industry that uh, has been studied endlessly and continues to be studied and more and more technology is coming into it. 
But in terms of effectively solving it, um, there's some very common and typical approaches. And what we find is that um, none of them are really that good. Uh, you know, you can go with a very expensive solution if you want to get a good one, but if you go with sort of a cost-effective solution, your accuracy that you can get is not very good. And that's where we spend a lot of time developing a specific algorithm, a proprietary algorithm to solve that problem. And when I say, if you can go to the next slide. Um, so this slide um, shares some numbers. These are from an actual actual test results from actual customer deployment uh, here in the San Diego area. And it's a very typical scenario. The, the, the panic button, uh, in this case, two buttons, one uh, implementing what we consider sort of the typical approach is labeled here as a standard approach. And the other one implementing uh, our um, location tech proprietary algorithm. And the, in this in these scenarios, the, the buttons, the beacons are, sorry, the buttons, the panic buttons are in a hotel room. Um, and again, this is from a existing deployment, a, li a live system. So not, not a fake setup. So here are four scenarios, and I won't go into the details of each of the scenarios, but basically they're in the room, the first three, the, the buttons are fixed, they're in a location, and the last one, the user carrying the buttons is moving around the room and into the bathroom as well. So what we found is that in the typical approach, the accuracy, which we define as getting the right room. So if you're in room 500, if the location uh, algorithm says you're in room 500, then that's a correct fix. But if it says 505 or 502 or 411 or whatever, then that's incorrect. So in the typical approach, you can see the percentage of accuracy. They're almost always below 50%, which is really bad if you think about it. Our proprietary approach, on the other hand, in the same identical scenarios, gives us close to 100% accuracy. So in other words, we not only get the floor correct, but we also get the room correct uh, almost every single time. In the on the orange numbers, uh, that is just a, a percentage of accuracy. Some of them include places where they even got the floor wrong, right? It's probably on the order of 20 or 25 percent of the time, even the floor was wrong. And as you can imagine, uh, from a first responders perspective, when we say the room is wrong, but it's the adjacent room, maybe you don't feel it's that bad. But if you if you actually were sent to the wrong floor that's going to add a whole lot of latency for the response because you know going to the next floor or the floor above or below is going to incur a lot of time uh, to to change for the responders so not all errors are equal some errors are really bad getting the wrong floor is really bad um, and so this is a mix of both in general the typical approach tends to be less than 50 percent accurate uh, and this is a proprietary algorithm we did uh, with with actually no increase in infrastructure, but purely based uh, on a on a algorithm that we developed. Um, any any comments, Jeff? You want to add to this? Yeah. I, so, um, from a non-technical standpoint, um, these numbers actually. I want to take the numbers away for a second. When we talk about fifty percent or seventy percent, even if they were ninety percent accurate. Um, it still is an issue with sending people to wrong people. And, and I want to be very clear, when, when I talk about hostage rescue or something else, this is not what we're talking about here because, because our preciseness in our location, it allows us to do this whole other arena of things that where we don't always know what the customer is going to have a problem with. And we'll, and I'll get into that a little bit later, but Accuracy even of 10% less accurate makes a big difference. And so from a, this was one of the key factors when we were looking at the company and I was, and we were talking as a group from the leadership is can we be 98, 99% accurate? Because we early on, as we, we all talked about, if we, if we can only be 90% accurate, then it's going to cause problems for the, for the end user, the hotelier or for in schools or other places. So the numbers look dramatic here, but even when it's just slightly off from where our accuracy is, it's still a very big deal. It's my comment from a non-engineering perspective. Thank you. Um, yeah, let's move on. So this was one of our guiding principles, like having the location fixes be uh, really accurate. 
The other thing I talked about as a principle was um, the network infrastructure or doing minimal infrastructure. Now, one of the considerations often in a deployment is how are your buttons, panic buttons, going to communicate with the network? Right? We call it a backhaul. In wireless terminology, that's called a backhaul. Um, typically, a lot of people use Wi-Fi uh, or cellular, or some, sometimes people use Bluetooth. Now, each of these things have advantages and disadvantages. So with Wi-Fi, you might think, okay, I already have Wi-Fi in the building, so it's great that they're able to reuse it. But that's actually not quite true because in order to use Wi-Fi, use your Wi-Fi, people have to know your username and password, so they have to program that into the buttons. So that's a bit of a problem because you have to do it individually one button at a time. And if you happen to change the password, well, there's a whole other challenge that you have to uh, solve. But on top of that, the, the buttons are going to be sitting on your Wi-Fi all the time, so it will take away from some of the bandwidth that your guests might need. Now, with cellular, you have two issues. One is that cellular coverage is not always ubiquitous in hotels. Like there'll be nooks and crannies that, like stairwells and places like that, where cellular is not going to penetrate. And if you're a smaller property, you really can't, uh, you know, invest in adding pico cells and so on in order to increase the improve the coverage. So you're stuck with blind spots. You know, one of the things that Jeff mentioned earlier. And then with cellular, there's always an added cost too, because you've got to pay a monthly fee to whether it's AT&T or Verizon or T-Mobile or whoever it is, right? It's not free. Um, finally, there's Bluetooth. And Bluetooth is, again, you can, you know, it's fairly cheap technology. But the challenge with Bluetooth is that its range, its coverage is pretty small compared to Wi-Fi or with cellular. So you end up having to install uh, a, a large amount of infrastructure nodes. In fact, some competition, some of the folks who use this have to install an access point, looks like a Wi-Fi access point, about the same size, in every single room. So that is actually a very expensive solution and also not very good if you want to cover between buildings. Right? If you want to go, if your property is a bit larger, if you have two or three buildings and you want to have coverage when people are moving between buildings, Bluetooth is not very good for that. So what we chose to do was to use this technology called LoRa, which stands for long range, and it's a standards-based technology. It operates in the 900 megahertz band. And what does that mean in, in, for, for the general user? It just means that its coverage is really good. It, it, it has uh, in open space, uh, that is when you're not inside buildings, it can cover up to 10 kilometer range. So as you can imagine, that's really good for outdoor coverage when you're between buildings and so on. Indoors, we still get really good coverage and penetration. It eliminates blind spots because that's just the way when you're at that lower frequency, 900 megahertz, that's just the way the wireless signals travel. Um, and we find that we are able to cover um, two to three floors with a single access point. Unlike, let's say with Bluetooth, where you might need an access point per room, right? So if you have 50 rooms on a floor, you're, you're putting in 50 access points per floor. So, the choice of LoRa um, gives us that uh, principle of minimal infrastructure, right? So we can put fewer access points and a maximum coverage without really increasing your cost because this is an open source technology and a number of people make the devices. So there's a lot of mar market pressures to lower the cost. And it's an unlicensed technology. So there is no extra licensing cost like there is with cellular. So that's uh, kind of our uh, thoughts around network infrastructure. Um, so let's go on to the next one. Um, so the other question that people often ask us is, should I invest in a panic button that also includes a radio or should I invest in a pure, should I just get a system with a pure panic button? And we think that this is actually a pretty critical choice. It may sound a, a great advantage to combine the radio and the panic button because, hey, I, I just can need one device. But that actually comes with certain hidden costs. The first one is that you have to give this device to all your people, even the people that don't need a radio, which adds to your cost because these radio plus panic button devices are more expensive than a pure panic button. Secondly, these devices become often become personal chatting devices because it's called Suneva Radio, and now you can talk to the other people for free. 
So there are lots of properties that actually restrict the use of personal cell phones just for this reason, because they don't want the staff to be able to easily just be kind of be distracted by personal calls and so on. But by handing everybody a radio, you're kind of walking back into that trap. But the most important point might be that the choice of a radio system is very critical and you don't really want to make that choice in a rush. Right? You just, oh, because I have to have panic buttons, let me just switch to a whole new system of panic buttons plus, plus radios, even though I don't know if that radio solution can really fit my radio needs. So what Location Tech offers is a sort of a hybrid solution. If you want to have pure panic buttons, so be it. But we also offer radios that can have, you know, include the panic buttons. Now, here's the best part. Our solutions can be interworked. In other words, you can have both at the same time. And as far as we are aware, we're the only solution in the market that, that you can do, uh, do that. Um, so to us, that has often been a big advantage because the, as you as a customer or the client gets to decide how you want to uh, adopt the technology, just start with panic buttons and add radios later on or start with radios right away. Um, but the other point I also make is that we are also uh, compatible. We, in fact, we work with Motorola radios. What that means is that if you have Motorola radios already, we can already use them as panic buttons because they're already supported. And you can add new ones and your existing radios will continue to work. Um, I don't know, Jeff, is there, uh, I know you're more uh, customer facing in this regard. Anything you want to add here? Yeah, I, I think, I think this is a good example. We'll talk about it um, a little bit later is we spend a lot of time listening to customers um, and this being put on Motorola radios or our functionality being added to Motorola radios was because customers asked us saying, hey, we have we have our housekeepers that want to have buttons carried, but then we also have pretty large security force and we don't necessarily want to give them buttons, but they already have radios. And so this, like most of our stuff or many of our stuff, comes directly from a customer asking us what to do uh, or if, if we can do this, which goes back to one of our justice guide and principles, is making sure that we're not just a one trick pony, but make sure we have a platform that we can add things to. So as customers ask, we, we can simply add it. We're not having to rebuild everything. So the radios came out of a direct uh, request from customers. Um, so the next point I want to make, and again, this somewhat goes into the whole uh, keep it simple and, um, you know, for the end user, but this may also be more applicable specifically to the Anaheim mandate uh, in that time is of the essence, right? So you don't want to be spending because there is a deadline on by which you need to be uh, installing the solution. Um, if you're spending a lot of time figuring out what is the most cost-effective solution, what is the what is the one that gives me the best growth for the future, um, that's going to take some time. And that's where the our approach of being modular, right? You don't have to put in anything more than you need today. That helps you out. And we actually have a very fast turnaround because we we're located right here in San Diego, uh, in, in Southern California, in the San Diego area. So. Um, we offer a way that we will you know, completely do the install, but we also can guide you through a self-install if that's of interest to you. But the important thing is that sometimes if you make a choice quickly, you might end up painting yourself into a corner with a solution that has very, very little room for growth. And that's not going to happen with location tech because we, our system from ground up is built for expandability and for growth uh, and only the ones that you want. Um, so you can make a decision quickly and get it installed and meet the deadlines of the mandate while not painting yourself into any corner or reducing your future options. Um, and let's go, let's talk of options, let's move. Yeah, so this one, Jeff and you know, we both alluded to this, how our solution, I'm not gonna get into all the details of the slide, but the basic point is that our system is a platform. So we, we you could start with panic buttons and then Jeff has a few customer case studies uh, later on in the webinar where he'll you know, talk specifically about these but once you have the panic button system in place you can add other uh, building monitoring kind of solutions in there whether it's water leak sensing air quality sensing theft theft detection tamper sensing and so on so without any added infrastructure that's the main part we'll add the new sensor of course uh, but 
you don't need any new infrastructure. And that's again, uh, our design principle from ground up. We wanna make it expandable, we wanna make it modular, and you shouldn't have to rip out and replace anything. So we call it the platform solution versus the point solution, uh, which is what a lot of the competition is, uh, which is you can get the panic button solution, but that's it. You really cannot add anything else to it. Um, go ahead, let's go to the next one. So this is, I think, the final slide that I'm gonna to talk to directly, uh, but the point I wanna make here is that, you know, that our system is, is simple. We talked about the deployment. I won't get into that here, but let me share a little bit about what our system looks like in order to use it. So, Vanessa, if I can get control, okay, there we go. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So, so this is. Uh, are you guys seeing it? Yes. Yes. Okay. So this is a live screen. Actually, this is a screen from a dashboard of a live system. Um, and if you knew our naming terminology, you could figure out what it is from the top of the from the address bar, but. But this is it. This is all you need to see. You you have uh, uh, two cards on the screen. One says critical alarms, and the other one says maintenance operations. If both of these are green, then you have nothing to worry about, nothing to look at. When if any of them are not green, then that's something. And here you can see there are some maintenance operations, right? And so when you want to go into that, if I click on it, it expands it. It tells me what the issue is. It tells me that there are some devices where the battery level is in alarm state. There are some devices that are offline and there are some panic buttons where the battery has died, right? So it's giving me all this information and when I'm done with it, I can just simply close it and it's boom done. But if I wanna go get further details, I can click on it and it expands it further. It tells me which of those devices they are and tells me exactly what they are, right? So we try to follow this principle of just pro providing you the information that you need. We don't want to make the spend a lot of time on making a lot of slick graphics. We actually did. Our, our, our backend used to look a lot different, but we found that people had difficulty navigating when you make things very complicated and put a lot of information. So we have distilled it down to just the essential information. But at the same time, if you want details, we've got details, right? You can also click on this and go into the details. Um, similarly, if there were and now if I want to collapse it all back, boom, that's it. Now, if I want critical alarms, as you can see, there's nothing at this point going on. Everything is okay, all green okay. I have 50 buttons, they're all okay. So it tells me at one look, I know everything is good in the system. Uh, and that's that was our principle. Now, in terms of notifications, we offer multiple ways. You can get it on your cell phone. as a, You can get it as a text message. You can get it as a phone call. You can get it as an email. You can, of course, keep looking at this screen. You can have your security folks monitor the screen. But we make it simple to receive notifications anywhere you're in the world, literally. Because if you have email or cellular access or internet access, you can get notifications. And we don't restrict the number of people who can be notified uh, or the time of day or so on. So our whole principle was, how can we make it easy to uh, use the system? And, and hopefully this was a good example of that. Um, so Vanessa, you can go ahead and take back control. Let's see, do I have to, yeah. Yeah. All right, here we go. Uh, yeah. Did, did we skip a slide? We I think did, we no cost of ownership. Ah, oh, you're right. Pardon, can't skip this. <laughs> no. So what, one of the things that uh, when we're, we're doing this is you, you look at proposals, since this is not just a, a one and done, you wanna look at the full life of the solution. So typically, we not typically, we recommend look at, look at the, the proposal over a three year run rate. What's it gonna cost for your capital? Uh, Cause there is a CapEx upfront and there's a annual fee after that. So, we, and one of the things that we come in is we are able to offer a lower total cost of ownership. The so not only just for a pure panic button system, but then what ends up happening is at least 50% of our customers end up adding functionality later on. So the infrastructure cost, the capex that was done in the very beginning, is now being leveraged to be able to add these other sensors in. So and the, and the sensor, the individual sensors are are pretty inexpensive uh, for what you're doing. So again. 
you're reutilizing what's or what's already out there and just adding to it. And so you're again, your total cost of ownership keeps getting better and better uh, as you start using the system in, in more ways to identify where something needs to be done and what is and what's signaling for the needs attention. It's not only just a person, but it could, it could be processes or it could be um, devices or equipment. Right. So Jeff, just to clarify, even without adding, even with zero expansion, uh, would you say that our cost of ownership is still the lowest or among the lowest? Correct. Thanks for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. So from here, we can go into some of our client case studies, those people who've already been there, done that. So um, Pilata is a good, great example, um, and it's twofold. One, because it's from the mandate that happened in Los Angeles for panic buttons. Uh, and when we started talking to them, they were wanted panic buttons, and they asked us about some other devices, and, and we said, well, great, but let's wait. Um, because the ROI, let's make sure the ROI is really there for, for the other things you want to add in. And we've talked to lots of different customers about other things that they want to add into. About a year into the, the program, one of the, the head the head of maintenance came and Greg came and talked to us and said, hey, we kind of have a problem. We have a water tower that uh, ran dry. And, uh, and he goes, it would have been great if we had known about it before customers started complaining about it. And uh, I, I was like, called me, I kind of scratched my head. I was like, Shh. Uh, and then I went back to the tech team. I was like, hey, can we solve this? And because we had the platform already set up and because we're operate on Laura, which has a ton of different solutions, we identified two or three options. And within a, within a week, we had tested them. And then uh, within a week and a half after that, we started the installation process. So we're... Um, and so this was something that prior to Greg calling us, we had never thought of that being a solution that was needed. But it's one of the key things we do is we listen and, and we're actually very open and actually appreciate it when customers come and tell us what their problems are, because that's actually how we get smarter, is what are the real use cases? Because we could be the engineers in the room and come with these great ideas, but if it's not what a customer needs or wants, then it's worthless. And so in this case, they came to us because they had to do the panic buttons. Um, sure, they thought it was a good idea for safety, but we'd never thought of the water cooling towers until they came in um, and talked to us about it. And so we were able to solve it in quick quarter. And it was and and so the the last part is kind of the last use case is we're we're always looking with them and looking at their kind of their line item budgets at the end of the year of what have, what have been unexpected costs that have hit them. And so then we start working backwards and okay. This hit, is there a solution to help reduce that cost? So Kawada is a great solution. One, they had to do it. And two, how they've been able to expand, expand their system after they'd already installed it and were very easily able just to add it in there. Again, from the previous slide, to lower the total cost of ownership because it's already installed, very simple to add. Rajesh, Vanessa, anything I'm, I'm missing? Clarification points on this one? Um, no, I think that's a great example of, you know, I think you made the point that this is not a use case we had anticipated, but at the same time, I'd say, sort of from an engineering standpoint, we had anticipated in the sense that by making a, a very general API and interface, uh, we were confident that we would be able to, um, you know, exactly meet these kinds of um, sort of unexpected or unknown uh, use cases. Yeah, actually, that's a really key point. Because and hand fingers, the the way that the the platform and the application and the technology is built, it's a very robust platform that allows these other devices to happen. So it is it's why we're able to add this water level sensor. It's also the reason why we're able to seamlessly add radios such as the Motorola, the Motorola Moto Turbo radios, which are the big ones that people traditionally see, 
along with their talk 25, the TLK 25, which is uh, a whole other solution. It's about the same size as a panic button. So um, key point, while it's very easy for the customer, simply add, it's because the work has been done up front to put all it to be able to add these devices in. So thanks for the clarification point for Josh. Mm -hmm. So Valley Views um, start out as panic buttons, and this is another use case of helping us be smarter um, and adding things going. So first was panic buttons, then they had a problem with the with the flood. Uh, guests flooded a room, um, caused forty thousand dollars of damage. Uh, we were talking to the head of security there. Boyd Long, he was, and he was kind of saying, oh, we just had to write this check for X. It didn't tell us that he was looking to solve. A week later, he came in and said, hey, what do you think about this for the solution? And he's like, oh, you can do that? They're like, yes, we can do that. And so we ended up installing that for him. At the same time, uh, this was the example of the Moto Turbos I talked about earlier. Is they were doing the panic buttons. Our security force, the security group, because it's a it is a casino. Actually, has pretty extensive security group. Um, and and let me be clear, Valley View is already a very safe place. It was already safe, so they didn't put the panic buttons in because they had a problem, but they were adding another layer of safety to their to their organization, and so. They already have these people that are that are called security guards, obviously, um, but they were carrying devices around, and so we were able to turn those on just by turning them on because we already had this platform built, we already had the infrastructure in place that we're able to turn their radios on. So now instantly, they are now able to do indoor geolocation, so right floor and right room throughout the property, and that's the case of install keep listening to the customer, even when it's painful, we install it. In these two cases, it they've been easy to solve. Um, so I shouldn't throw on painful because nothing's painful for the, for the tech team. So <laughs> probably painful, the tech team, when I keep asking these questions, can we do this? So they keep saying yes. So um, Ocean Park Inn is a, is a good example of a small property because we've talked about Valley View Casino, which is a big casino. Casino floor, large area campus, HR buildings. Ocean Park Inn is a, is a smaller property. It's along the beach um, and just quite great. And so they wanted just a simple panic button solution. But what's been great about them and their, and so the example is small buildings, we can do them, no problem. But it's also, again, this is a good use case is as with, with Elvin, I've actually sat down with him several times and we look at his line item budgets and saying, what is your cost for this? What is your cost for refrigeration if it goes down? What is your cost for water? What is your cost for other things? And then we go line by line and say, this is what the cost would be to add this in. Does it make sense financially to do it? What is your, what is your payback period? Is it under a certain time? And we've set it up there under a certain time, we install it. If it's not, then we don't install it, but we sit down and we look at their line item budgets and their line item cost structure from past year and figure out how can we help them become more efficient in running their operations. So I think it's a prime example. And this is a good example of while the difference in, in between a 50% accurate, 70% accurate, or even 90% versus ours makes a difference because we're able to get down to the room level and know when someone's in a room, if we have that turned on, so if it's a union hotel, we don't have it turned on, but we were able to track and create efficiencies um, and identify it. So I'll open up again, Vanessa or Rajesh, what have I missed or anything? No, I think that's a <clears throat> that's a good summary of what we had to do in, in both Valley View and, uh, and Ocean Park in. Um, I think those are good examples, Jeff. Yeah, thanks. By the way, just a shout out to Ocean Park Inn. If you if you guys are looking for a great hotel on the beach in in San Diego, great place to go. Yeah, <laughs> love love doing love doing going there and working and talking to Elvin because I get a look right at the beach. So, um, excellent, and we love hearing from from inquiring minds. So I'm excited that we have a couple questions actually. So the there's a couple. I'll start with the first. 
um, part of the Anaheim um, hotel worker requirements is a limit on the square footage um, that say a housekeeper can clean in a typical shift. So is does our solution help with managing that? Jeff yeah, or Raj, I, I, or both of you? Yeah, I can take that, Rajesh. Sure. Um, so in LA, that's absolutely required. Um, that part is coming up in a later vote. Um, so for clarification on that, but what the, I think what the questions, question is asking, can you get this, the, understand how long someone's been in the room, if that's an act, like in LA, absolutely is enacted. And because of our accuracy, we can give you the right room, which is now where the 90% or 70% or 50% really comes into, into play. Because if you have a dispute on where someone was in, all that is tracked in our history and taken care of. So, so you can even go back and identify it. So back to the short answer, yes, because we're accurate, we can we can identify and make sure that they're the cleaning limit so you don't run into overtime because uh, you get some pretty big overtime bills and what are you going to do for labor? And, and, and this is a good example of being able to look at your workforce to figure out sometimes it might be more efficient to pay someone overtime than it is to hire us hire another resource and because we look at the we can do that time analysis and on our data you can do that so um, we do have that we do have the ability to do it because of our accuracy so um awesome so the next question um is sort of related and it's um it's a question about asset utilization and how we think our solution contributes to uh, initiatives around efficiencies um, for asset utilization. I, I can take that Rajesh unless you want to go. Sure, no, no, go ahead. I can add to. Yeah, so it, it goes back to um, Kawada is a good example of it. Like we never, um, and by the way, that's like Kawada's example of water tower did not impact um, cost. So by what they were trying to do didn't solve a cost issue. And I would say directly, it didn't impact revenue, but indirectly it absolutely did because it impacted the customer's experience. So the customer experience was that all of a sudden what something that they expected water, uh, and it could be a cooling tower or, or the tower to provide water, whatever it is. It didn't give it didn't give the ideal customer experience that they wanted, and so because we have this flexibility and because we have this adaptability and because we can do all these parts, we're able to solve those easily. Again, going back to what we just talked about earlier, a platform versus a point solution and being extensible to be able to add all these different things. And so, because of being able to do these things, and the two questions are related. It's around utilization for a particular part of the law, which is in LA and being voted on Anaheim, but because we have the robustness in our system, we can say, yes, we can solve it. It wasn't like we had to go back to scratch, but it also goes back to asset utilization to make sure you use the assets that you have in your property most effectively and efficiently. Okay. Josh? No, uh, not a whole lot to add to that. Um, you know, mainly we, we try to respond to specific requests that customers have, the specific problems that they have. Uh, you know, we have a number of examples we can quote, but the main point is our platform is engineered in a way that we can respond or add added, added functionality um, that really benefits the end user without added cost. Right? You can always have one-off solutions that come with a huge cost. Uh, if it's a vertical solution, but given that ours is just an add-on uh, that you choose to do as much or as little as if you want, that's that's really the big advantage with our system. Fabulous. Any, any other questions? Come up. Not yet. So with okay. that, we promised to have a pretty uh, efficient presentation today, and we have come to the end of our questions and the end of our presentation. Maybe final words, Rajesh and Jeff, and we'll close it out. Um, sure. Um, 
Yeah, I can just so I just re-emphasize kind of some of our design principles. I mean, from an engineering standpoint, which is really my view. <clears throat> Although being part of Location Tech, I did have the opportunity or do have the opportunity to meet most of our customers face to face, and usually before they sign a contract. So it's given me an opportunity to really understand what they want and we have evolved. If you if you had happened to see our system on day one, it looked very different because we we had a very engineering centric point of view and there was lots of lots of bells and whistles. But uh, talking to customers and knowing what actually they need and what works for them, we've actually simplified it. And the simplicity is hides a lot of complexity behind it, but we're okay with that. And so I'll, you know, I'll just end with that, that even though our system looks simple, that's by design, but that actually um, camouflages a, a lot of um, complexity and functionality that is possible and, and, and they're under the layers. So I'll just pass it off to Jeff to close it out. Yeah, I, um, maybe I should talk about customer something facing, um, but I'm actually not at this point because I'm actually going to use this kind of as an opportunity to say, I, I, as I'm listening to this, to Rajesh talk, and I'm and it's reminding me of other conversations we're having with leadership um, at Location Tech. I, I, I'm and I think back to my days as a Navy SEAL. I worked around some really talented people. Uh, one of the gentlemen's up for the Medal of Honor right now, as as we speak. So something happened a while ago. He received the Navy Cross. It's being reviewed for the Medal of Honor. And there's some other uh, people that that are doing some other things that are very similar. So I work with some really talented people. Again, not about me, but the people I was surrounded with. I have um, so I'm grateful for the people that I work with at Location Tech because I've now recognized that I had this rare opportunity to work with just some really great world-class talent. And so when a customer asked me if I could do, if we can do something, or they ask for Josh, and we talk about it internally, and they say, yes, we can solve this, and here's how we do it, I have zero doubt in my mind if we can do it or not. And so as the CEO, it's nice to have confidence in your team, the people that you're around, that when they say they can do something, I don't hesitate and I don't worry about if we can deliver. So when we were asked early on, do, can we do the Motorola? And they said, yes. I was like, great, fantastic. And I didn't him and ha about, can we do this or not? And so I'm very, very grateful. And it is one of our competitive advantages that as time goes on, it'll start becoming more and more apparent of just how talented the team is that I'm working with. So thank you. And that, and you two are, Vanessa, you're a good example of that. Rajesh, you're a good example of the others. So grateful to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And so with that wisdom, we'll sign off. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, you'll be hearing more from Location Tech very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.